Okay, so let's get started. So what I thought I'd do is um, we'll sort of introduce ourselves, uh, those of us that have either had a BBS or have had some sort of contribution to uh, modem communications and stuff like that. And then uh, those of you that are here just to listen and learn, that's fine. You can We'll just skip over you if you want or if you want to say something. There'll be a chance for everyone to sort of contribute their memories, if they have any. Greg, do you even know what a modem is? <laughs> I was watching that video for a while. Yeah, <laughs> I think I think modems came and went before head. before he was even born, but that's okay. Well, we still have modems. That's all. Well, yes, thing but thing. but in the traditional sense, the dial-up modems uh, that we're here to sort of talk about today. So um, I'll start uh, just to get things going to sort of give you an idea what I'm looking for, and then we'll we'll pass it on. So. Um, of course, I'm Sid. Those of you, I'm sure most of you know me. So I started out uh, just dialing into local modems, and we have some operators from some local BBSs here. And I also wrote, I ended up writing three BBSs uh, in my time, and I also wrote <clears throat> several doors. We'll talk about what doors are for those that don't know in a little bit. And so the first bulletin board I wrote was called Private Heaven, and Jason ran that, and he's here with us today. The second one that I wrote was called the Maxi BBS, which was a conversion of Private Heaven, but on the Apple, and I'll explain why later on. And then the third one I wrote was something called the Executive BBS, or Exec BBS, which was never released. Uh, it used the most fantastical technology. It was light years ahead of its time, not really. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it was it was really cool, far too ambitious for what it should have been, and of course still remains literally in the closet downstairs beneath me right now on a rotting floppy disk that I really need to archive. So, and I'll talk about some of my other contributions as we go. Next, we'll we'll go to Dave Russ, who's on the phone, because you're the closest one to me, Dave. I hear you. And you want to just sort of give us an introduction of who you are and what you did? Well, this my name is David Russ, and I was uh, I started a BBS in 1984 called Color 84. I wrote the code for it uh, in BASIC. That's all I knew how to, to code. And I originally got my idea for it from a gentleman named Ray Prouse, who has started a penthouse BBS on Fairview Lab. And I went to see him. I was interested in... in uh, the whole setup of BBS. So I went to see him one day and he sort of showed me what it was about and, and uh, I went on from there. Okay. And I had uh, a lot of... Uh, is Bob Hipkin there? Bob did not make it. Oh. He was supposed well, my, to, but he, he didn't He was going to fill in the spots that I can't remember anymore, but uh, we started off with a... Uh, I wrote the code on a Color Computer 2, I think it was, um, which had a, a grand, well, actually, we went up to Color Computer 3, and it had a grand total of of uh, 64K memory, if memory serves me. And we started off with one floppy drive, if anybody knows what that is, uh, single-sided. I mean, Bob Hitkin, through his magic, worked us up to four double-sided drives. <coughs> And uh, I can't remember how much storage there was in each of those drives, but it's minuscule in comparison to what we have now. And I had a lot of help from people, uh, people like Sid, who uh, uh, also looked after prizes for the golf tournaments, and Bob Dickman, John Brent, Tim Philp. Is Tim there? Tim is not here, and John normally would be here, but he's, uh, he's not here today, but he... Uh... We always we talk to John about the old days all the time. One of the things I did find, Dave, here, believe it or not, is I found the trophy I got in 1986 at the golf tournament for having the best idea. I was wondering if you could tell me what that idea was because I can't remember. Oh, jeez. No, I said I can't. It was only 30 years ago, Dave. It was what? What did you say? It was only 30 years ago. Yeah, right. I should remember that. Eh? <laughs> I do remember you getting ribbons for prizes, and I do remember I won a lot of them from the golf tournament. Yeah. And it wasn't fixed. Fixed. 
<laughs> okay, and we're going to pass the gauntlet on to Steve. Right, Steve here, I guess. <laughs> All right. My name is Steve Hunter. You probably remember me more from WordPro early days, but I also wrote uh, my first BBS in 1981 which uh, was difficult because back in those days, all we had was acoustic couple modems that did not answer the phone. So big problem I had to overcome was, how do you get it to answer the phone? So I built a little simple circuit. I was still kind of into hardware in those days. And uh, built a little answerer, which could be disconnected from the computer using one of the ports on the uh, Commodore's uh, user port. And uh, that got around that problem. So my first PBS went up in uh, April of 81, so that's 35 years ago. <coughs> Uh, being a very unimaginative person that I am, I called it WordPro. <clears throat> yeah, what the hell? <laughs> and uh, it was it was a lot of fun. But back in those days, when it was brand new, so many things could go wrong, and there was always people out there who just wanted to bring your system down. And it brought down every single night for the first little while. But I learned a lot about how to make software uh, immune to that kind of thing. So after a little bit, it stopped coming down. And uh, <laughs> I ran this sort of single operating BBS for a while, but when the Commodore 64 came out, I decided to shift from the Commodore PET, which I'd originally written it on, uh, to the 64. Uh, back by then, I, you know, we had some floppy drives that could hold a fair amount of stuff, at least messages anyway. And uh, we had auto answer modems that didn't connect to the phone through acoustic couplers. I was telling somebody here just earlier, one of the big problems with acoustic coupled modems wasn't the modem, it was those stupid phones. <clears throat> those phones had carbon microphones. Carbon microphones had small particles of carbon in them, loosely packed, so that as you spoke, the sound waves would cause the, the carbon to pack and unpack a little bit, and this would change the resistance and subsequently provide a signal. Problem was, when they were exposed constantly to the beeping, constant single tone of a modem, they started to align themselves and pack permanently. So over time, a few weeks, your signal got weaker and weaker and weaker until you basically had to take the phone and go bang, bang, bang on the side of the table to loosen the carbon particles. And you're back in business for another couple of weeks or so until your microphone got all packed up again. So it was a fun time. But anyway, by, by the time I did the BBS for the 64, the uh, modems were a bit more complicated, a little bit faster. Uh, we started into 1200s and 2400s and so forth. The Commodore 64 could go up to those speeds, but it had problems. Uh, the chipsets in the 64 didn't really like running at those kinds of speeds. So what we had to do is we had to actually tweak them to get them to run properly at exactly 1200 or 2400. And they were kind of prone to screwing up over time. Uh, I went through so many 64s either because of failures of the chip that drove the modem or the power, the power supplies, which <laughs> were notoriously poor. Uh, and also they crashed easy. Uh, we had this fan in our bathroom, which, when you turned it off, generated just enough of a pulse that it would lock up any Commodore 64 in the next room. And uh, we always had to, like, no, no, don't turn the fan off now, <laughs> because, you know, and uh, you'd have to reboot, get all started again. So it was a bit of a problematic thing to run on a 64. Uh, the chips were going bad, the power supplies were going bad, the computers were crashing. It was a terrible machine to run a BBS on. Uh, but uh, eventually I got a Commodore 128, which did away with most of these problems. It was far more stable. It was a bit faster. It didn't crash. It had a better power supply. Uh, notice I say better. <laughs> it was still bad. Uh, but as time wore on, um, I got a, a PC. Actually, my first one was a Commodore PC, PC-10-3. And uh, I thought, okay, it's about time that I shifted the BBS over to that. And that became PC PunterNet. Now, the PunterNet name came about from this network I decided to create for my BBS. Being a poor marketer, though, I didn't get very far with it, but there were a number of nodes, and I even had one in Australia. Uh, it never was a competition for the bigger uh, BBS no networks, like FighterNet, but it had a number of nodes, and it was popular for a while. Uh, basically, it was just a BBS that, at night, when the phone rates were cheaper, would make long-distance calls to other nodes on the system, and they would trade messages, so that when people logged in locally, they would be able to see messages that had been generated on other nodes elsewhere in the world without them having to call long distance to talk to the people who were there. Uh, so anyway, that sort of went on for a little while. And uh, uh, actually, uh, most of the work on the PC version was uh, sort of funded by, nobody remember Jeff Goble? Mm -hmm. Anyway, 
he and uh, another guy decided to fund it, and uh, oh, it never really got off the ground. It uh, not not commercially anyway. Um, they put some money into it, and I put some time into it. But for the most part, it was dead by the end of the decade or 90s anyway, because CBSs were pretty much dead by then. By the late 90s, the internet was already starting to take hold, and it wasn't really worth continuing to run a BBS anymore. But that's basically my history. The other thing that I seem to be well known for, although I never really set out to do this, is a so-called punter protocol. I happened to write a, a, a transfer protocol that was sort of similar to XModem, uh, that became very popular amongst Commodore users because it was available on most of the terminal programs available for Commodore machines. So there's even a, there's a, a page on Wikipedia about it, which I have nothing to do with. Uh, but uh, I seem to be better known for that than you ask me, oh, it's part of protocol. I'm going, well, I guess so. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, that's, that's my background. Uh, but as far as my computer background, I go all the way back to the very first Commodore PET. I actually got my PET pretty much the week it was first released in 1977. So floppy disks, I wish. <laughs> we had tape drives <laughs> and uh, and uh, 8K of memory. You can imagine writing any kind of meaningful software in 8K, bearing in mind that you had to put your data somewhere. So, you know, it, it was a fun time. But uh, most BBSs didn't come around until the early 80s. And by then, we had Commodore machines that were a bit more powerful, had a lot more memory, and it was much easier to actually write a, a BBS with a floppy drive. Because, you know, honestly speaking, I don't see how you could write one without it. Uh, you didn't have enough RAM to do it in RAM. Cassette isn't random access, so that's out of the question. So yeah, I guess BBSs were kind of impossible until we had random access storage in the form of floppies, and uh, that would have been the early 80s. And, uh, well, I think that covers it. I should move on to the Next one. Oh, it's it's very interesting that you mentioned both the Coco uh, bulletin board and uh, the problem you had with uh, the Commodore 64 locking up. I have a friend named Scott Nuds, and if you do a if you do a search on the internet for his name, you'll get a good laugh. <laughs> but uh, he he actually did a Coco 2 uh, bulletin board system that he never released because uh, he was having problems with it, and one of the problems was that it kept dropping carrier, and whenever his furnace would come on. <laughs> The carrier would drop, and he had no idea why it was happening, which was really funny. But my name, by the way, my name is Bill Moeller, and I ran a bulletin board system in Hamilton called System Reset for the Atari. I started out running uh, under uh, Karina, which was a uh, which was a basic uh, machine language hybrid, and then I switched over to uh, something called Ex uh, BBS Express, written by uh, was it Keith Ledbetter? Yeah, Keith Ledbetter, which was very good. And uh, we actually had uh, we actually had nodes too um, that and our systems were very reliable. I had a 80 meg hard drive uh, attached to my Atari, and uh, I really enjoyed that for a while. But uh, as you said, the internet came along, pretty much uh, pretty much killed the bulletin board system scene. So anyway, that's all I have to say. So that's enough. Yeah. That's enough. Nope. That's perfect. I was his co-sys up, and now. Uh... Actually, anything you saw on there was actually more me. Oh, <laughs> all wow. the graphics, all the designs, all the menus, that was all me, man. <laughs> I'm Lawrence, and... Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I never actually wrote any BBSs. I started out modeming with a 64 and 300 baud, and then I got a 1650 clone. Oh, sorry, name's Ken Rath. Um, and when I went from 300 to 1200, it wasn't at the point where I don't think I'm going to be able to read the text on the screen. It's going across the screen so fast, going from 300 to 1,200 baud. Yeah, that's the great thing about 300 baud. You could, you could still read you it. You could read yeah. it. <laughs> um, so later on, when we got into the Amigas, I, I ran a BBS called Best Destiny BBS in London, Ontario, on my Amiga 3000 tower for a while, and, and uh, used a product called Excelsior BBS, which was written, unfortunately I can't remember the gentleman's name, but he was from Quebec, and wrote a couple of doors for it. And I also did uh, FidoNet on it, and then there was like an Excelsior net, which was somewhere, probably similar to what you did with your punter net idea. And, uh, and of course, it got uh, slowly shut down because of the commercialization of the internet, too. So, but while it was running, it was a lot of fun. My, my punter net node in London was run by Dave Eisner. Hmm. I hope this is still running. Uh, so as Sid mentioned, my name's Jason Gambacourt. Um, Sid and I know each other from high school, um, but I think uh, I'll try and make the story short. Uh, 
I think my first interest in computers was a friend of mine named Steve Ito. Uh, he was uh, he's a Japanese guy, and he would get all kinds of great technology before any of us would see it because it would come from Japan. So it was awesome to go to Steve's house and see what he had. He had little handheld video games that I'd never seen before. And for Sony Walkman he had, it was amazing, right? So uh, anyways, his, his dad had purchased a Commodore 64 in a package. I think it came with a monitor and uh, uh, a desk, I think, was part of it, and a data set, no disk drive. And I think it was probably something ridiculous, like two grand or something by the time he was done with it. But it also came with a Vic modem. And uh, we just, we played games on it. We played Lemonade and, and Snoopy Math or something on it. And uh, we figured, what, what are we going to do with this modem? We have no idea what to do with it. So I uh, did a little, little bit of investigating and um, found out what bulletin boards were and that there was a local board in town that you could call, a few of them. And uh, Dave Russ's board was one of the ones that come up. I think the only way you could find out who was running boards in the day was to go to the local computer center and find a sort of a list of BBSs to call, right? It was kind of like this underground society that you couldn't really figure out until you knew who to talk to. So anyways, uh, long story short, we, um, uh, I didn't even have a computer at this point, but uh, Steve and I both got on our 10 speeds. I think we were probably 15 years old or 14 years old and drove our bikes to Dave Russ's house to give him our uh, $10 yearly uh, fee. And, uh, and then we were hooked. Uh, next thing you know, I had a 64 with uh, disk drive and... Uh, um, Played some games on it, but I was really uh, excited about modem and uh, like modem communications, right? So, so I don't know how you and I said started talking about it, but it just came to pass at some point where you had Private Heaven One on disc, and you asked if I wanted to run it, and uh, of course I was all excited as a teenager and thought, oh, uh, I can be a sysop. Oh man, that's the coolest thing ever, right? So, um, so yeah, I ran Private Heaven One for a little while, and it wasn't long before uh, you could come out with a second version called Private Heaven 2, which ran a whole lot better. I uh, had a few more options, and um, uh, so we ran that for the, for, the, for the most part. We ran that version. Um, had a pocket modem, 300 baud, right? Uh, if you tweaked it, you could get it to squeeze out 450, which was pretty awesome because it almost come in quicker than you could read it. But um, um, yeah, so, you know, like uh, any kid in his room, I had this running in my, in my room for... It was 24-7, and, you know, my $8 a month for my phone line was the only thing I had to pay. And um, and it was great. Met a lot of people. Um, you know, social events based on the people you meet on the boards. Now, the board that we had, uh, it was fairly basic. It had one disk drive, so there's really only room for messages and, and a user list and some limited menu options. There's some funny little games that you might speak to that uh, we put on, like the, the um, extended Choose a Story storyteller that was pretty cool but no files no games no doors you know um although i think the software had the ability to have files uh, i just didn't have the storage space you can only fit so much on a floppy right so um yeah so basically uh that's what i stuck with for a while and I never really uh I, I kept that 64 and i ran the board for quite a while you were working on exec sid when we were thinking about pushing it out but then next thing you know time goes by and it's time to go to college and and you leave all that stuff behind, right? So that's kind of where I left it. Um, and uh, I think I still got my original 64 somewhere, and I think I still have Private Heaven on floppy somewhere, but uh, yeah, but, but that's my story. So. Hi, I'm Sylvia Gallus, and I'm Steve's significant other. Um, we met in 1983. You didn't let me say it. <laughs> we met in 1983 on his bulletin board, and we talked and chatted on the board. And eventually, when I, um, I think I signed up for a assembly language course that he was teaching, and then we went to a donut shop and you know just to talk and stuff, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and went the on old from there. Donut shop. Yeah. <laughs> always but, but it was his board where we originally met on, <laughs> and. Uh, so, so he was doing bulletin boards a lot, and I ended up running the Toronto Pet Users Group bulletin board for some time near the end there, just before everything kind of gave up to the internet. And actually, the existing Toronto Pet Users Group board was transferred to the internet. They took all the files and everything, and they put them online. And I still have it. I have the computer and everything. It's all sitting there still. Steve still has his first uh, BBS computer. Uh, we don't have the drive, but we still have the disks that will run the 64 version. 
Anyway, that's it for me. <laughs> so, I have another little story I want to tell. Online dating one. Yeah. Actually, Jason met Jason met an early girlfriend too. So, one of the things you have to understand, those that have never run a BBS, is that it takes over your whole computer, right? Like these computers are and your they, phone line. They were not yes, they were not multitasking to speak of. So, literally, when you were running the bulletin board, that's all your computer was doing. And also, at this point in time, the majority of people had one computer. It's not like you know, certainly not like here where there's so many computers in the home. You were lucky if you had one. And if you had that one, you were, you were sacrificing quite a bit to run the bulletin board. So in my case, what happened was I had written this software, but I wasn't running it. I, I wanted to play uh load runner and, and other things on my 64. So Jason was running, you know, that software, but I still wanted to run a BBS. So, I translated that BBS, converted it over to the Apple II because I was fortunate. I had a VIC-20, a 64, and an Apple II clone. The Apple II clone was not getting a lot of love from me. It, it actually was a monochrome screen, and I just didn't play that much on it because I found the games on the 64 to be better. So it was just sitting there, so I, I moved it over to the Apple II, and I... I called it the Maxi BBS because my phone number, the, my second line for my modem, because I had to get that second line. As you mentioned, your phone line got tied up. So the number was spelt out 753 Maxi. So, okay, it's the Maxi BBS. So I had to learn how to do all the communication code on the Apple II and so on. Got that all figured out. And then anyone who's ever run a BBS knows that one of the most popular features is chat with the sysop. So everybody would want to talk to the sysop and sometimes the sysop would want to talk with you. And then over time, as you ran the board longer and longer, the novelty of talking with everybody and everybody <laughs> kind of wears off. At least it did for me. So unless it was a woman. Unless, yes. Online Yes, <laughs> yes. If it was a girl, that was a... I, like, not, the sysop wants to chat with you. <laughs> oh, hello. <laughs> now entering chat mode. Um, so, one of the other things that the Apple II, of course, adhered to the ASCII standard properly, whereas the Commodore used its Petski, right? Which wasn't, wasn't 100% ASCII. One of the things that happened on the Apple II was if you hit Control G, which was, uh, you know, ASCII seven, code seven, that's the equivalent for the bell code on the old terminals. So whenever that character came across the line, the Apple II would beep. Well, that's very quaint, but at three in the morning, when someone's just sitting there and wants to chat with you, and they hit the chat button and it's not you're not responding, control G, control G, control G can be really annoying. And let's remember, I'm a teenager with this thing in my bedroom, right? We didn't have computer rooms or offices. It was in it was in my bedroom. So I had actually built the Apple II clone. So I had I knew the hardware quite well. So I installed a switch on the speaker. I'm not a hardware guy, but I knew enough to do that. And I put a switch in there and I had it so that I could turn it off. And then one day, I don't know how, Dave, if it was you invited me or somehow I managed to go over to your house and I got to see Color 84's operation. This was an exciting day for me. I still remember this going into your basement and like, oh, yeah. there's, there's this computer you've got set up and you've got drives everywhere. And you've got stuff everywhere, just stuff. Yeah, and, I had I had one computer that was just separate for the bulletin. Yes. I had another one for myself. Right. Well, see, you were an adult, mature adult with a good job, and were able to do that. <laughs> That's you right. Know, you know, it, Jason and I were like teenagers <laughs> who were still cashing in pop bottles to be able to pay our ten dollar annual fee. For that. <laughs> so no, it wasn't quite that bad, but no, I, and, and I saw, so I, one of the things that I saw at your house, and I don't know if I've ever told you this or not, Dave, so this could be a big revelation for you today, okay. is that you had the most cool thing I'd ever seen in terms of a BBS operation that I 
I was very impressed with, and that was, okay, so being mostly a Commodore guy, the joysticks on the Commodore are just digital. They have, I just wrote an article for Best Buy about this, so I'm, I'm just, it's all fresh in my mind. So the, the joysticks for the Commodore were copies of the joystick that the Atari made. And the Atari joysticks were essentially digital. They were up, down, left, right, and then you had your diagonals if the up and right were down at the same time. And then you had yep. the fire button. That's it. But the Coco and also some of the other computers on the market had an analog joystick interface. And so you had very cleverly, and I want to know where you got this idea, if you stole it from someone else or not, but you had this really cool thing where you had a set of paddles hooked up to your system and you had a little switch that moved back and forth and it, it just said on and off. And I was looking at it and I was like, what is that? And you said, oh, well, that's for chat mode. If I'm available, I slide it to on. And if I'm not available, I slide it over to off. That's right. And I thought that was the coolest thing hey, I've hey. ever seen because it was like this magical custom button that you didn't have to press a key on the keyboard. You would simply slide this thing one way or the other. And I think I might have even asked you how it worked and you told me, well, it's, it's a pentameter. I can just read it. And if it's if it's, uh, it goes from, you know, uh, 0 to 255, and if it's less than 127, I'm not available. If it's 127 or greater, I'm available. You never thought of putting a switch on your speaker? I had the <laughs> switch on the speaker. I just said that. Yeah. But this was different. This was, yeah. uh, this was whether or not the system would attempt to page you, right? Because that would be the key. The people would press. It was always C for chat, and it was like it would sit there, and it would page the sysop like three times or five times. And the user would have to wait. And then if you were around, if you were in the bathroom and you heard it and you ran over to your computer, great. If not, you didn't, right? And if you weren't available at all or you just didn't want to talk to anybody, then it would simply say, I'm sorry, the sysop's not available. And it wouldn't even attempt to page you. And so I thought that was cool. So when I made my own BBS on the Apple, well, guess what? The Apple had an analog interface for the joystick and it had a paddle. And damn if I didn't steal that idea. And I put that in my code, and I even put the on-off thing on the sticker on the joystick so I could, I could do that. So I want well, to know. I had a patent on that, you know. Well, you money. I'm sorry. The, the time for the royalties, <laughs> the claim for the royalty has died. The time's up. <laughs> so did you come up with that idea, or did you steal it from somebody else? I want to know. I want the truth. Well, as far as I can remember, uh, it came from Paul Stillwell. I don't know if you knew him. Yes, I know Paul. Yeah. Anyway, he worked for Radio Shack, and he came up with a number of these brilliant ideas. I think that was one of his. Wow. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like such a, a trivial thing today, but it was actually a very um, a very interesting feature at the time. It was very handy. It was very handy, yeah, because that was the thing. Everybody always wanted to, to chat. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to ask everybody on the panel was... And, and the, the only word that I've heard here today is what I feel is the correct term, which is SISOP. How many people heard people say SISOP, and how many times did you want to kill them? Everybody's raising their hands. So was anybody, did anybody say SISOP, and if so, why? Anybody? Anybody here today? Yes. Is everyone? Is, <laughs> yeah. Is, yeah. Any, no gifts. <laughs> anyone here afraid to say SISOP? Good. Good. I was, I was too busy being annoyed by Americans who thought my name was Putner. So. <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> can, I, can I ask a question, sir? Sure. We're talking about the bell going off at three in the morning. Yeah. Whether you're a modem user, whether you're a BBS runner or whatever, raise your hand if you forgot to turn the speaker off when you were down on your modem and woke everybody up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, raise your hand if you weren't smart enough to have not put a chat feature in your BBS. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, speaking of the chat feature, I was telling this story to Brian and, uh, earlier, and, and uh, on my media, of course, media had the save program, so you could get a speech to save. And sometimes I'd be over at my friend's house, John Hicks, and he ran an alternate image BBS. And I would call from his system into my BBS, because when I tried to call home to let my wife know that I was staying a little longer and geeking out, 
to be on the phone, so I would actually have my Amiga drop it down and, and run the save program, Honey to Please Get Off the Phone. And the first time I did that, I scared the crap out of her. <laughs> so it was over. Nice. When I, when I first got my modem, I was living at my grandmother's house, and she had a party line. So I, oh. that's illegal to use a modem on a party line, so I would go up, get up at 3 in the morning and call bulletin boards for say, 3 to 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And uh, someone said to me, why are you always posting messages at 3 a.m.? But uh, the, I remember I took this, I, it was a pocket modem, an Atari 400. I took it over to my friend's house, and uh, we, we started calling bulletin board systems. And his dad came down really angry and said, I want you to stop doing illegal things in my house. You see, he had seen these war games and knew that it was illegal to call other people's computers. So well, I couldn't believe that. Now, how many people were got surprised by a phone bill from long distance that was way more than they ever expected it to be? Anybody? Well, I almost did. <laughs> I'll tell you this one. I had uh, my network was set up, and something went wrong with it one night, and it stayed connected to a bulletin board in, in the United States for seven hours. <clears throat> so that would have been a hefty bill. Now, I don't like Bell Canada as a company, but one thing they did do right was I called them up the next day and I explained to them that it was a computer and it wasn't supposed to be connected and it wasn't doing anything. And they immediately gave me credit for the whole call. Oops, oh, you lost your call. You lost it. <laughs> See? Yeah. Yeah, it was That's what happened. I said something bad about Bell. And yeah. 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 Is that yeah. Bell? No, no, it's Rogers, oh, so well, that case it's worse. Been, uh, <laughs> Bell's listening on Rogers? Yeah, yeah Bell, must be. that's right. They're <laughs> listening in and... I missed Hello. The board. Were you tired of the call and hung up, or? I don't know what happened, <laughs> but I'm using a different phone now. All right, well, we got you back. Well, that's a good point you just brought up about listening. I mean, there was something different about the BBS era. I mean, it was the culture or, the, or just the, the whole entire thing. Like, now, that, you know, there's chat rooms on the Internet, and there's, you know, a lot of access to a lot more information now, but there was just something different about that whole era. But it was pioneering. I mean, well, everything, everything we do today, exciting. everybody takes for granted. I don't care how I don't care every time somebody comes out with some new app or something. And they go, oh, this is so groundbreaking. People look at it and go, no, it's not. We're just doing the same thing we were doing, but twisted it around a little bit with something new. But back then, nobody had ever done that before. You were breaking ground. You were doing something that people just never had done before. I mean, okay, there were companies that had been doing this, and you know, scientists and all that, but but people weren't. I, I think it was more intimate. I, I was a weirdo because I connected yeah. my computer. To yeah. it. Sorry, the guy on the phone saying something. Yeah, he was saying. Dave was saying it was more intimate. Yeah, uh, it, it was more personal. You probably knew a lot of the people that called in. And, uh, I don't know what the other fellows there who ran BBS is did, but we used to have social events throughout the year and yeah, you know, golf tournament, and Christmas parties and pool parties and yeah, and, didn't, uh, didn't we know, throw Tim Phillip in the pool? Where you met people and had fun and wasn't the way the internet is now. Yeah, see, that was the difference. Like, you dialed in, and eventually you got to know these people that you were leaving messages for. Yeah, there was only a handful of them. Or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like, you got to know these people, and then you're gathering like, on, on the side of it. And the other thing, being what you're saying, like, you were doing all this yourself. Like, you didn't just go Google something. Yeah. Like, you had to, you had to figure it out, or you had to go and get together with other people that were doing the same thing. I think there was a, there was a bar for entry. And therefore, yeah. the only people participating were people who were able to kind of yeah. look forward. Yeah. Exactly. I now, thought bulletin well, board systems became really exciting when they started to network. And I was calling Toronto, and they were calling Germany, and they were calling yeah. Holland, and so on. And, you know, you post a message, you reply, and get a, a reply a week later. Yeah. But uh, I think that was a real exciting time for bulletin boards. And they really went through different eras, right? I mean, the first, I distinctly remember... The first era being sort of just the fact that you could connect to another computer and you could see messages that other people had left. So there was always messages that were, if you remember composing email and addressing it to all, all would be, you know, everyone could read it. Or then there was messages you could send privately, which was a new concept. And um, the other thing was, I mean, you mentioned, Jay, about finding out about other boards. Almost all the boards had... A listing, other boards. a listing of the other boards, right? So you would write down those phone numbers, and I mean, 
the other thing you have to remember and understand for someone like you, Greg, I just have to use your example because you're, you're probably the youngest one here, but <laughs> you typically these board, the first generation of these boards had one phone line, right? So if you went to call it, you'd get a busy signal if someone else was on it. Well, when you were in the mood to go board surfing, you wanted to connect, you, you'd take anything, mm. any board, didn't matter how crappy the board was. As long as it answered. As long as it answered. So you would literally go through the list and try to connect to the next one and the next one and the next one. And uh, I don't know if anyone remembers, like I remember getting frustrated sometimes because mm. as the hobby became more popular, it got tough, right? Because you could go for like half an hour before actually getting mm -hmm. to connect. And remember feeling like you won the lottery when you'd hear the phone start to ring? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then your mom picks up the phone. Ah, yeah. No. yeah, yeah, get off the phone, son. Um, but it was, and then of course, there was a slightly more advanced era when, to me, the sort of the second generation was when there was things like a lot of file sharing going on. Because initially, it wasn't about file sharing. No. Initially, it was just sending messages and i remember i think i think dave you had a feature like this too where there was kind of a like my favorite sort of feature was a storyteller type thing where you would call in and literally someone would start a story and it would say you know there was a guy right, walking yeah. down down the street and he saw a dot 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 and then the next person yeah. would come in and connect and comment on that and build the story it's and so primary on. school the message, the message section on in color 84 was often used as sort of a debate circle yes. we got some really good discussions and arguments and so on on there yes that's true and there was and i remember thinking too like there was a lot of grown-up discussions again keeping in mind at the time i was a teenager right so right. It, it was uh kind of interesting to see some of this stuff going on because you guys were having some very adult kind of conversations at times and Wait, he generated quickly enough that's when yeah. i first, that's when i first learned that all the catch-all gag that any discussion has finally reached rock bottom the moment somebody mentions Hitler. Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> Doesn't matter what kind of discussion it was. We That's played a game. multiplayer game on the Atari called Nebula, which was a really great game. I know you only. <laughs> my friend kicked my ass all the time. I sucked at it, but it was so fun. It was so fun. Such a fun game. But to go back to what Dave was saying about not being able to get on there anymore. I gotta do my trail on my game. Yeah. yeah. I can't get through. At midnight. It'll, yeah. it'll, it'll just go. keep dialing yeah. and dialing. Yeah. And dialing. yeah. So I, I remember, the, and then, yeah, the next generation kind of had more advanced games. I remember playing, uh, and of course, when those advanced applications, as you might call them, or whatever, became doors, right? That's when sort of the doors era came in, when all that, those special extensions to the BBSs were doors. And there were doors for, you know, I remember playing a game that was a lot like Risk. And, yeah, you had to, like, take your turn and then call in the next day and wait for your other player to have taken his turn. And it was just, uh, it was it was awesome. And it was also frustrating, like, at the same time. So I, maybe some of us here that ran boards that had doors, my perception as a user, I never ran a board that had one, but I did play some. It seemed to me that when you entered the door, took the menu option to play a game, that the entire BBS software that was in memory at the time would be sort of flushed with the exception of just a few items to keep you connected, and it would replace that with the door software. Is that, yes. Is that clear with what would happen? Because remember, you would take the option, and you would wait for it to load. Yes. <laughs> Sometimes quite a long time, depending on how, how big the game was. Right? Yeah, and in fact, um, <clears throat> when I mentioned the exec BBS, my, my next generation software, of course, I was trying to do this on a, a Commodore 64 with 38k of free memory basically and I had come up with ideas for I mean every board had to have some sort of a text editor built into it to allow the user to post a message and typically the text editor was very basic right it would allow the user to write a line and then uh, it would allow for backspaces that was about it most times you couldn't if you recall, once you hit enter, the line above was already committed. You were you were done. You couldn't certainly cursor around like a word processor or a word pro. Uh, um, you couldn't do any of that kind of stuff. You literally were very limited in what you could do. And so I wanted to have the coolest text editor ever built into a BBS. So I had made this text editor for execs so complicated that you could do things like 
You could put slash C at the end of your text and it would center the line for you automatically. You could have it. I mean, I remember the one big thing, and I think Dave, you used to do this. You would have these great text files that you probably edited on something else and then put them on your board. And you would have like borders put around your, <clears throat> your documents that were fancy, like asterisks all around them and your text all centered. And like, it just looked nice. And, but it probably took you a, you know, a little bit of effort to make it look that way. And so I had actually built in a feature into my text editor that allowed you to like automatically put a box around something. Like I just went beyond, like I just, I lost my mind somewhere in features and I was doing all this cool stuff. But the problem was, is that the text editor used up almost the entire amount of Ram in the 64. So the board couldn't do anything else. So I had to make it as a module and the 64 didn't have the operating system itself didn't have any way to manage, didn't have any memory management at all built into the operating system. Oh, by the way, it really wasn't an operating system. It really was just a bunch of ROM routines that did some simple stuff. So I literally had to do some manual overlays of stuff in memory. So I would literally, when you went to edit a message, it would load the editor off the disk drive. And then, so you'd have to say, it would say, please wait. It would load that in. So Doors did the same thing. They would they would literally become separate programs that had enough to get, and you had enough left probably to get in and out of those stub modules, and that would be it. So that's why doors would always be slow. And of course, if you had a Commodore, especially, your disk I.O. was horrendously slow. So you'd be waiting a long time for stuff to load and, and save and all that kind of stuff. So for sure. And I know that's one of the things about exec that I liked and one of the things that I disliked. You know, one of the things about the full screen editors, I had one as well. Since you were relying on the connection to keep a synchronization between what the user was doing and what the computer thought he was doing, you needed a 100% perfect connection. Any bit errors that could change, for instance, a cursor up into something else, meant that there was no longer synchronization between the user and what the computer thought he was doing, and this would totally ruin the message he was trying to write. So this is one of the, the issues with that. This is back when, as, as uh, Sid has said, there was no operating system to speak of, so we couldn't rely on the OS to do anything for us. These days, we accept that any OS will come with virtually a, a rich text editor built into it, to allowing us to create the text we want to send before we send it. No reliance on the far end for that at all. No reliance on a connection. <clears throat> but back then, you couldn't do that. So the fancier you got, the more, the more a, a prisoner to the perfection of the connection you became. You know, it was one thing to have occasional characters come out wrong when it was just displaying a message. But the moment you relied on cursor up, cursor down, cursor back, and all these things to move stuff around, you became a, you became a prisoner to that connection. And uh, plenty of people, I, I'm sure, got totally messed up by a single bit error while they were trying to use one of those full screen editors. That's just <laughs> the way it was. And you hang up, and then you call back, and it doesn't answer. Yeah, <laughs> you're taking it the, yeah, you're taking, you're taking the board down with you. And remember that some computers, the backspace was inconsistent. Some some computers had a destructive backspace, yeah. and some didn't. So you always to be safe, you always had to do a backspace space Space, backspace. backspace. So you actually to do a delete, you actually had to send three characters. And so that if you remember remember the stuttering that would yeah. happen, could you be the blah every time you hit the backspace? Oh, I missed that. No. <laughs> uh, doors, doors on my system, because it was Amiga, it was hard to write the task in mm -hmm. a powerful lot. But if I remember correctly, a lot of the doors were actually written in AROS, which fell yeah. on top of the Amiga OS. So we got that extra multitasking, extra thing. So the BBS was totally born with AROS uh, with the doors itself. We just launched the AROS routine. Yeah, but you're lucky enough to have enough RAM to do that. Yeah. We're talking yeah. about machines that had so little yeah. RAM, yeah. you couldn't afford to have two things in at once. That's right. I'm going from memory, so what? Express, Speaking of low RAM. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Express bulletin board, uh, we had the command modules that were like little 16K command modules, so the game would be no bigger than 16K, and I think it would just load in uh, very quickly, and we used to have those in a, in a RAM disk, uh, which, uh, so it was almost instant. And it didn't really take over the whole thing. And the Atari uh, had really good uh, I.O. So it was a 
to get to get around it was no condor or cereal. We've got I took a lead for the city for pork and yep. ran the old I took a lead dry. That's yep. all faster. Yes. Yeah, because there wouldn't have been a fast load cartridge. They were also more reliable <laughs> machines, too. Those old 40, 40, 80, 50 drives. They were much more reliable than, than any of the serial commodore drives, like the 1541s. Yeah. yeah. More is a relative term. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, twice as much well, as nothing. Yeah. yeah. Or if you, had the, if you had the SFD yeah, drive, you had, you had one megabyte. Yeah. That's like... Yeah. I actually did have one of Commodore's... Uh, Hard drives at one time, the 9090, whopping 7.5 megabytes of storage space. Uh, they were actually, because uh, I was doing WordPro at the time, I got lots of hardware, you know, for the purposes of my work. So I had plenty of those things. But 7.5 megabytes is, of course, nothing. You know, one MP3 and that's it. <laughs> you know. Yeah, by today's standards. So. To wrap things up, so is there anything, what's probably the, for those that ran BBSs, what was probably the the most significant thing you took away from it? What what do you look back on today as your most, I don't know if it's your most happiest memory or the most significant thing that you could say you took Sophia. away? Sophia. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Well, Steve wins. Steve I win. Is pretty easy. <laughs> Dave, what about you? Um, well, I enjoyed the whole thing. That's why I ran it for, you know, uh, from 84 to 97, I think it was, but wow. uh, friendships, I think, was the biggest thing I took away from it. Yeah. So ironically, as much as it was, a, uh, on the surface, it was a very faceless communication thing. It ended up creating lifelong memberships. I mean, I certainly, I, I wouldn't have met you and, and John and Tim without uh, without the BBS for sure. Yeah, in the same way. I made a lot of friends there, including you and, and John and uh, quite a few others, Tim and Jason. So uh, it was that was the most rewarding part to me. Yeah. Jay, what about you? Yeah, I, I would agree with Dave. Friendships. Um, but much like Steve, I, had, uh, uh, I did meet a uh, love interest as a teenager on a bulletin board. And uh, my mother had this curfew that I couldn't be talking on the phone past nine o'clock at night she wanted me off the phone so i would hang up with my girlfriend and then we would just connect and chat and my mother just thought i was working away on my computer <laughs> <laughs> so that was probably doing best. doing homework doing homework <laughs> on my computer yeah. But, uh, yeah i would say friendship the social network is uh, it, it, was, it was a social network in the day right so yeah that's what i enjoyed yeah, yeah. 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 i'm gonna say true. something negative uh, i just found a lot of eccentric people yes. and uh, uh, one guy, Roman. yeah, one and one guy uh, really freaked out on me once when uh, I had a com uh, an absolute computer crash, and because I didn't have a, a complete backup, and that he had to actually type his name again and register again, he just got so mad that he didn't call my board at all. Again. Oh, oh, <laughs> well, wow. you're probably you're probably better off he didn't. I know, but you know, he was just uh, people like that really. Well, well, I have an apology to to somebody. I. Uh, I shut down the Maxi BBS at some point. I don't remember when it was, but it was my Apple II, and I, I turned it off, and the drives were still connected to the computer. The computer went in the closet, or something happened to it. And about ten years later, actually getting getting ready to open this computer museum, I uh, I found that old Apple computer and I turned it on, and there was an email in there that I had never received, read, or replied to. <laughs> I don't even know how I, I I actually don't think I remembered my my password for the bulletin board, but I remembered the back door password. Uh, and for those that wrote BBSs, if you if you wrote any BBS that you uh, passed on to other people, you always had a back door. I had a back door into to Jason's board, so if he ever decided to lock me out or uh, change my account or something like that, I always had a way back in. And uh, I got in and I was like, oh my gosh, I, here's an email here I missed somehow. So I can't remember who the email was from, but if it was from anybody in this room, I apologize. I still haven't got back to you. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't bother connecting the BBS back to the phone line. But uh, I think um, you know it's easy for us now to see that uh, the the message boards are the equivalent of the modern day forum, and of course e the email is uh, a much more global form of the email that we had on. Uh, 
on the bulletin boards. But uh, hey, at the root of it all, um, it's the same. It's the same thing, right? Bulletin boards and 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 the web are just uh, social. similar things. They've become social things as well, and uh, they're just a much more interesting way to uh, you know work with computers. And I think for those of us that went through it, it's an experience. Though it's different enough that I think we'll always look back on it fondly and remember it and uh it was good times and for those that i met through that uh, way i i thank you all a lot of a lot of you are still friends with so i'm grateful for that so thanks everybody for sharing your memories add one, you may add whatever you'd people, like i agree with what people said on the social thing and all that um the only one experience i had was and again going back to my friend john and his link ebs he was probably an example of early identity theft somebody had actually logged on to his BBS to use my address and phone information to get an account on his BBS. Interesting. Yeah. So, wow. Yeah. But that's, I mean, aside from that, it was all positive and great experience from, like I said, the social thing, but also but learning and, and, and trading. Just one question I have for people. Did anyone, did any of your friends think you're a weirdo because you were online back then? Yeah, yeah everyone thought weirdos. I was nuts. Yeah. And now I go, well, you're online. Yeah. Look, you're online. Yeah. Yeah. Until the file sharing came in and I showed them like a very pixelated pornography. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> scan by and, by scan line, waiting for it to yeah. come in. Now I can send then it. I was a coolest Now I can send dick pics. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Sid? Yeah? I just wanted to thank you, Sid, for putting this together. It's been a lot of fun and brought back a, a whole bunch of good memories. Oh, no problem. And it and, and the, the porn comment at the end just goes to prove that the internet's still being used or communications are still being used for the same things. Nobody said, nobody said yeah. Hitler. That's right. No, no, but nobody said Hitler. Hitler. Not, no, not till the end. Yeah, Steve did. Oh, wow. <laughs>